Welcome back. Um, so we had a busy lesson last week, and um, uh, I was really thrilled to see actually one of our master's students here at USF actually um, actually took what we learned uh, took what we learned um, with structured deep learning and turned it into a blog post, which, as I suspected, has been uh, incredibly popular because it's just something people didn't know about. Uh, and so it actually ended up getting picked up by the Towards Data Science publication, which I quite like actually, if you're interested in keeping up with what's going on in data science, uh, it's quite a good medium publication. Uh, and so Karim um, talked about uh, structured deep learning and basically introduced you know, the, 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 the basic ideas that we learned about last week. And um, it got picked up quite, quite widely. One of the One of the things I was pleased to see actually Sebastian Ruder, who actually mentioned in last week's class as being one of my favorite researchers, uh, uh, tweeted it, and then somebody from Stitch Fix said, "Oh yeah, we've actually been doing that for ages," which is kind of cute. Uh, I, I, I kind of know that this is happening in industry a lot, and I've been telling people this is happening in industry a lot, but nobody's been talking about it. And now that Karen's kind of published a blog saying, "Hey, check out this cool thing," and now Stitch Fix is like, <laughs> "Yeah, we're doing that already." So. Um, so that's been great, uh, uh, great to see, and I think there's still a lot more that can be dug into with this structured deep learning stuff. You know, to build on top of Karam's post would be to maybe like experiment with some different data sets, maybe find some old Kaggle competitions and see like are there some competitions that you could now win with this, or some which doesn't work for would be equally interesting, um, and also like just. Experimenting a bit with different amounts of dropout, different layer sizes, you know, because um, nobody much has written about this. Uh, I don't think there's been any blog posts about this before that I've seen anywhere. Um, there's a lot of unexplored territory, uh, so I think there's a, a lot we could we could build on top of here. And there's definitely a lot of interest. I saw one person on Twitter saying, "This is what I've been looking for for ages." Um, another thing which uh, I was pleased to see is. Um, uh, Nikhil, who we saw his um, cricket versus baseball um, predictor as well as his uh, currency predictor after lesson one, um, went on to download something a bit bigger, which was to download a couple of hundred of images of, of actors, and he manually uh, went through and checked which. One. Well, I think first of all he like used Google to try and find ones with glasses and ones without, then he manually went through and checked that they had been put in the right spot. Um, and this is a good example of one where vanilla ResNet didn't do so well with just the last layer. Um, and so what Nikhil did was he went through and tried unfreezing the layers and using differential learning rates and got up to 100% uh, accuracy. Um, and the thing I like about these things that Nikhil is doing is the way he's he's not downloading a Kaggle data set. He's like deciding on a problem that he's going to try and solve. He's going from scratch from Google. Um, and he's actually got a link here even to uh, the suggested way to help you download images from Google. Uh, so I think this is great. And I actually uh, gave a talk uh, just this afternoon at Singularity University to an executive team of um, one of the world's largest telecommunications companies and I actually showed them this post um, because the, the, the folks there were telling me that, that all the vendors that come to them tell them they need like Millions of images and huge data centers full of hardware and you know, they have to buy special um, Software that only these vendors can provide and I said like actually this person's been doing our course for three weeks now And look at what he's just done with a computer that costs him 60 cents an hour um, and they were like They were so happy to hear that like okay, they you know, this actually is in the reach of normal people um, I'm assuming Nikhil's a normal person. I haven't actually met him uh, <laughs> If you're proudly abnormal, Nicole, I apologize. Um, I actually went and actually had a look at his cricket um, classifier, and I was really pleased to see uh, that his code actually is the exact same code um, that we used in lesson one. I was, I was hoping that would be the case. You know, the only thing he changed was uh, the number of epochs, I guess. Um, so this idea that we can take those four lines of code and reuse it to do other things, it's definitely turned out to be true. And so these are good things to show, like at, at your organization, uh, if you're anything like the executives at this big company I spoke to today, there'll be a certain amount of like Not just surprise, but almost like pushback of like 
if this was true, somebody, you know, they basically said if this was true, somebody would have told us so. Like, why isn't everybody doing this already? So, like, I think you might have to actually sh show them. You know, maybe you can build your own with some internal data you've got at work or something, and you're like, oh, here it is. You know, didn't cost me anything. It's all finished. Um, uh, Vitaly or Vitaly, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, has done another very nice post on. Um, uh, just an introductory post on how we train neural networks and uh, I, I wanted to point this one out as being like I think um, This is one of the participants in this course who's just got a particular knack for technical communication And I think we can all learn from you know from his posts about about good technical writing um, what I really like particularly is that he he assumes almost nothing like he has a kind of a very chatty tone and describes everything but he also assumes that the reader is intelligent but you know, so like he's not afraid to kind of say here's a paper or here's an equation or or whatever But then he's going to go through and tell you exactly what that equation means uh, so it's kind of like this nice mix of like writing for a Respectfully for an intelligent audience, but also not assuming any particular background knowledge um, So then I made the mistake earlier this week of posting a picture of my first placing on the Kaggle seedlings competition at which point five other fast AI students posted their pictures of them passing me uh, over the next few days so uh, This is the current leaderboard for the Kaggle plant seedlings competition. I believe the top six are all fast AI students or in the you know, worst of those teachers um, and so I think this is like a really um, Oh look James has just passed he was first um, this is a really good example of like What you can do you know, this is uh, I'm trying to think it was like a small number of thousands of images uh, um, And most of the images were only were less than a hundred pixels by a hundred pixels um, And yet we you know I bet my, my approach was basically to say let's just run through the notebook We have pretty much default took me. I don't know an hour um and I'm, uh, I think the other students are doing a little bit more than that, but not a hell of a lot more. And basically, what this is saying is, yeah, these these techniques work pretty reliably to a point where people that aren't using the fast AI libraries are, you know, literally really struggling. Um, I suspect all of these are fast AI students. You might have to go down quite a way. Um, so I thought that was very interesting and really really cool. So today we're going to start what I would kind of call like the second half of this course. So the first half of this course has been like getting through like these are the applications that we can use this for. Here's kind of the code you have to write. Here's a fairly high level-ish description of what it's doing. Um, and we're kind of we're we're kind of done. For that bit and what we're now going to do is go in reverse We're going to go back over all of those exact same things again But this time we're going to dig into the detail of every one and we're going to look inside the source code of a fast AI library to see what it's doing and try to replicate um, that so in a sense like there's not going to be a lot more Best practices to show you like I've kind of shown you the best best practices. I know but I feel like for us to now build on top of those to debug those models to come back to part two Where we're going to kind of try out some new things, you know, it really helps to understand what's going on behind the scenes Okay, so the goal here today is we're going to try and create a pretty effective collaborative filtering model um, uh, Almost entirely from scratch so we'll use the kind of we'll use PyTorch as a Automatic differentiation tool and as a GPU programming tool and not very much else. We'll try not to use its neural net features We'll try not to use Fast AI library any more than necessary. So that's the goal so Let's go back and you know, we only very quickly looked at collaborative filtering last time So let's let's go back and um, have a look at collaborative filtering and so we're going to look at this uh, movie lens data set so the movie lens data set um, Basically is a list of ratings It's got a bunch of different users that are represented by some ID and a bunch of movies that are represented by some ID and a rating 
Um, it also has a timestamp. I haven't actually ever tried to use this. I guess this is just like what what time did that person rate that movie? Um, so that's all we're going to use for modeling is uh, three columns user ID movie ID and rating and so thinking of that in kind of structured data terms user ID and movie ID would be categorical variables uh, we have two of them and rating would be a uh, would be our dependent variable um, we're not going to use this for modeling but we can use it for looking at stuff later we can grab a list of the names of the movies as well uh, and you could use this genre information I haven't tried to uh, be interested if during the week anybody tries it and finds it helpful um, my guess is you might not find it helpful we'll see so um, in order to kind of look at this better I just grabbed um, the uh, users that have watched the most movies and the movies that have been the most watched um, and made a cross tab of it right so this is exactly the same data but it's a subset and now rather than being user movie rating we've got user movie rating uh, and so some users haven't watched some of these movies that's why some of these are not a number okay uh, then I copied that into Excel and you'll see there's a thing called collab filter dot XLS um, if you don't see it there now I'll make sure I've got it there by tomorrow um, um, and here is where I've copied that table okay so as I go through this like setup of the problem and kind of how it's described and stuff if, if you're ever feeling lost feel free to um, ask either directly or through the forum um, if you ask through the forum and somebody answers there I won't need to answer it here um, but if somebody else asks a question you would like answered of course just like it and um, your net will keep an eye out for that because uh, kind of as we're digging in to the details of what's going on behind the scenes it's kind of important that at each stage you feel like okay I can see what's going on okay um, <clears throat> okay so we're actually not going to build a neural net to start with um, instead we're going to do something called a matrix factorization um, uh, the reason we're not going to build a neural net to start with is that it so happens there's a really really simple uh, kind of way of solving these kinds of problems which I'm going to show you um, and so if I scroll down I've basically what I've got here is the same the same thing but this time these are my predictions rather than my actuals and I'm going to show you how I created these predictions okay so here are my actuals right here are my predictions and then down here we have our score which is the uh, sum of the different squared um, average square root okay so this is RMSE down here okay so on average where our, our randomly initialized model is out by 2.8 so let me show you what this model is and I'm going to show you by saying how do we guess how much user ID number 14 likes movie ID number 27 and the prediction here this is just at this stage this is still random is um, 0.91 so how are we calculating 0.91 and the answer is we're taking it as this vector here dot product with this vector here so dot product means 0.71 times 0.19 plus 0.81 times 0.63 plus 0.74 plus 0.31 and so forth and in you know linear algebra speak because one of them is a column and one of them is a row this is the same as a matrix product so you can see here I've used the Excel function matrix multiply um, and that's my prediction um, having said that if the uh, original um, rating doesn't exist at all um, then I'm just going to set this to zero right because like there's no error in predicting something that hasn't happened okay so what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to say all right every one of my rate rate my predictions is not going to be a neural net it's going to be a single matrix multiplication right? now the matrix multiplication that it's doing is basically in, in practice is between like this 
matrix and this matrix, right? Uh, so each one of these is a single part of that. Okay? Um, so I randomly initialized these. These are just random numbers um, that I've just pasted in here. Um, so I've basically started off with two random matrices, and I've said let's assume for the time being that every rating can be represented as the, the matrix product of those two. Um, so then in Excel, um, you can actually do gradient descent. Um, you have to go to your options, uh, to the add-in section, and, and check the box to say turn it on, and once you do, you'll see there's something there called solver. Uh, and if I go solver, it says, okay, what's your objective function? And you just choose the cell, so in this case we chose the cell that contains our root mean squared error, and then it says, okay, what do you want to change? And you can see here we've selected this matrix and this matrix. And so it's going to do a gradient descent for us by changing these matrices to try and, in this case, minimize, because it says min, minimize this Excel cell. Right? GRG nonlinear is a, is a gradient descent method. So I'll say solve, and you'll see it starts at 2.8, and then down here you'll see that number's going down. Right, we, it's not actually showing us what it's doing, but we can see that the number's going down. So this has kind of got a, a neural netty feel to it, in that we're doing like a matrix product and we're doing a gradient descent, but we don't have a non-linear layer and we don't have a second linear layer on top of that. So we don't get to call this deep learning. So things where people do like deep learning-ish things, where they have kind of um, Metrics products and gradient descents, but it's not deep. People tend to just call that shallow learning. Okay, so we're doing shallow learning here um, Right, so I'm just going to go ahead and press escape to stop it because I'm sick of waiting um, And so you can see We've now got down to the 0.39 All right, so for example um, It guessed that movie 72 for sorry movie 27 for user 72 would get 4.44 rating 2772 it actually got a 4 rating so you can see like it's 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 doing something quite useful um, So why is it doing something quite useful? I mean something to note here is The number of things we're trying to predict here is uh, there's 225 of them right and the number of things we're using to predict is that times 2 so 150 of them so it's not like we can just exactly fit. We actually have to do some kind of machine learning here. Uh, so basically, what this is saying is that there does seem to be some way of making predictions uh, in this way. And so, for those of you that have done some linear algebra, um, this is actually a matrix decomposition. Normally, in linear algebra, you would do this using a, a, an analytical technique or using um, some techniques that are specifically designed for this purpose. But the nice thing is that we can use gradient descent to solve pretty much everything, including this. Um, I don't like to so much think of it from a linear algebra point of view, though. I like to think of it from an intuitive point of view, which is this. Let's say movie, uh, sorry, let's say movie ID 27 is Lord of the Rings Part 1. Um, and let's say um, movie... Uh, and so let's say we're trying to make that prediction for user 20, 72 uh, Are they going to like Lord of the Rings part one? And so conceptually That particular movie maybe there's like there's four sorry, there's five Numbers here and we could say like well What if the first one was like how much is it sci-fi and fantasy and the second one is like uh, how recent a movie and how much special effects is there, you know, and the one at the top might be like how dialogue driven is it? Right like let's say those kind of five these five numbers represented particular things about the movie and so if that was the case Then we could have the same five numbers for the user saying like okay How much does the user like sci-fi and fantasy? How much does the user like? modern uh, this is a user uh, modern CGI driven movies. How much does the, does, does this uh, user like dialogue driven movies? And so if you then took that cross product You would expect to have a good model, right? You would expect to have 
a, a reasonable rating. Now the problem is we don't have this information for each user. We don't have the information for each movie. So we're just going to like assume that this is a reasonable kind of way of thinking about this system. And let's and let's stochastic gradient descent try and find these numbers. Right? So so in other words, these these factors, we call these things factors. These factors, and we call them factors because you can multiply them together to create this. Right? They're factors in a linear algebra sense. These factors, we call them latent factors because they're not actually, this is not actually a vector that we've like named and understood and like entered in manually. We've kind of assumed that we can think of movie ratings this way. We've assumed that we can think of them as a dot product of some particular features about a movie and some particular features of to look what users like those kinds of movies. Right, and then we've used gradient descent to just say, okay, try and find some numbers that that work. Um, so that's that's basically the technique, right? And it's kind of uh, the and and the, the entirety is in this spreadsheet, right? So that is collaborative filtering using what we call probabilistic matrix factorization. Um, and as you can see, the whole thing is easy to do in an Excel spreadsheet, and the entirety of it really is this single thing, which is a single matrix multiplication um, plus randomly initializing um, Jeremy, we would like to know um, if it would be better to cap this uh, to zero and five maybe yeah so that no you don't question. get yeah and we're going to do that later right there's a whole lot of stuff we can do to improve this this is like our simplest possible starting point right so so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, try and implement this um, in Python uh, and run it on the whole data set. Another question is how do you figure out how many You know how it's clear how long are the metrics? Yeah. Why is this five? How, yeah. Yeah So something to think about <clears throat> Given that this is like movie 49, right? Um, and we're looking at a rating for movie 49 Think about this. This is actually an embedding matrix and so this length is actually the size of the embedding matrix. I'm not saying this is an analogy, I'm saying it literally. This is literally an embedding matrix. We could have a one-hot encoding where 72, uh, where a 1 is in the 72nd position, and so we'd like look it up and it would return this list of five numbers. So the question is actually, how do we decide on the dimensionality of our embedding vectors? And the answer to that question is, we have no idea. Uh, we have to try a few things and see what works. Um, the underlying concept is you need to pick an embedding dimensionality which is enough to reflect the kind of true complexity of uh, this causal system, um, but not so big that you um, have too many parameters that it could take forever to, to run, or even with regularization it might overfit. So what does it mean when the factor is negative then? The factor being negative in the movie case would mean like this is not dialogue driven In fact, it's like the opposite dialogue here is terrible a negative for the user would be like I actually dislike modern CGI movies So it's not from zero to whatever it's a uh, the range of Score would be negative. Is yeah. there a range of score even like no, no ma maximum? No, there's no constraints at all here okay. These are just standard embedding matrices Thanks uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so first question is uh, why do why why can we trust this embeddings? Because like if you take a number six it can be expressed as one into six or like six into one or two into three and three into two Oh, so are you saying like we could like reorder these five numbers in some other different order or like the value itself might be different as long as the product is something same. Well, but you see we're using gradient descent to find the best numbers So like once we have found a good minimum the idea is like Yeah, there are other numbers, but they don't give you as good an objective uh, value mm. okay. And of course we should be checking that on a validation set really which we'll be doing in the Python version and the second question is uh, when we have a new movie or a new user do we have to retrain the model? That is a really good question, and there isn't a straightforward answer to that 
um, time permitting we'll come back to it um, but basically you would need to have like a kind of a new user model or a new movie model that you would use initially um, and then over time yes you would then have to retrain the model so like I don't know if they still do it but Netflix used to have this thing that when you were first onboarded onto Netflix it would say like what movies do you like and you'd have to go through and like say a bunch of movies you like and it would then like train its model Could you could you just find the nearest movie to the movie that you're trying to, to the new movie that you're trying to add and then yeah you could use nearest neighbors for sure uh, but the th the thing is initially at least in this case we have no columns to describe a movie so if you had something about like the movie's genre or release date who was in it or something you could have some kind of non-collaborative filtering model. And that was kind of what I meant by like a, a, a new movie model. You'd have to have some some kind of predictors. Okay, so a lot of this is going to look familiar, and and the way I'm going to do this is again is kind of this top-down approach. We're going to start using a few features of PyTorch and FastAI, and gradually we're going to redo it a few times in a few different ways. Um, kind of doing a little bit deeper each time um, Regardless we do need a validation set so we can use our standard cross-validation indexes approach to grab a random set of IDs um, This is something called weight decay which we'll talk about later in the course um, for those of you that have done some machine learning uh, It's L2 regularization basically uh, And this is where we choose how big a um, embedding matrix do we want? Okay, um, so again, you know, here's where we get our model data object um, from CSV, um, passing in that ratings file, which remember looks like that. Okay, so you'll see like stuff tends to look pretty familiar after a while, um, and then you just have to pass in um, the uh, What are your rows effectively? What are your columns effectively? And what are your values effectively? Right. So any any collaborative filtering recommendation system approach, there's basically a concept of like, you know, a user and an item. Um, now they might not be users and items. Like if you're doing the that uh, Ecuadorian groceries competition, there are stores and items, and you're trying to predict how many things are you going to sell at this store of this type. Right. Um, but generally speaking just this idea of like you've got a couple of kind of high cardinality categorical variables and something that you're measuring and you're kind of conceptualizing it as saying okay we could predict the rating we can predict the value by doing this this dot product um, interestingly uh, and this is kind of relevant to that that last question or suggestion an identical way to think about this or to express this is to say Um, when we're deciding whether user 72 will like movie 27, it's basically saying which other users liked movies that 72 liked, and which other movies were liked by people like um, user 72. It turns out that these are basically two ways of saying The exact same thing. So basically what collaborative filtering is doing You know kind of conceptually is to say okay this movie and this user which other movies are similar to it in terms of like um, Similar people enjoyed them and which people are similar to this person based on people that like the same kind of movies so that's kind of the, the underlying Structure at any time. There's an underlying structure like this that kind of collaborative filtering approach is likely to be useful Okay, so um, so you, yeah, so there's basically two parts, the two bits of your thing that you're factoring, and then the the value, the dependent variable. Um, so as per usual, we can take our model data and ask for a learner from it, and we need to tell it what size embedding matrix to use, um, how many, uh, sorry, what uh, validation set indexes to use, uh, what batch size to use, and what optimizer uh, to use. And we're going to be talking more about optimizers. Shortly, uh, we won't do Adam today, but we'll do Adam 
next week or the week after. Uh, and then we can go ahead and say fit. All right, and uh, it all looks pretty similar. Interest uh, it's to usual. Interestingly, I only had to do three epochs. Like this kind of model seemed to train super quickly. Um, you can use the learning rate finder as per usual. All the stuff you're familiar with will work fine. Um, and that was it. So this took, you know, about two seconds to train. There's no pre-trained anythings here. This is from random from scratch. Right? Uh, so this is our validation set, and we can compare it. Uh, we have this is a mean squared error, not a root mean squared error. So we can take the square root. Um, so that last time I ran it, it was 0.776, and that's 0.88. And there's some uh, benchmarks available for this data set. Um, and when I scrolled through and found the bench, the best benchmark I could find here from this um, recommendation system specific library, they had 0.91. So we've got a better loss in two seconds uh, uh, already. So that's good. Um, so that's basically how you can do collaborative filtering with the fast AI library without thinking too much. But, so now we're going to dig in and try and rebuild that. We'll try and get to the point that we're getting something around 0 0.77, 0 0.78 from scratch. Um, but if you want to do this yourself at home, you know, without worrying about the detail, that's, you know, those three lines of code is all you need. Okay, so we can get the predictions in the usual way, and you know we could, for example, plot um, SNS is Seaborn. Seaborn's a really great plotting library. It sits on top of Matplotlib. Um, it actually leverages Matplotlib. Um, so anything you learn about Matplotlib will help you with Seaborn. It's got a few like nice little plots, like this joint plot um, here is uh, I'm doing uh, predictions uh, against um, against actuals. So these are my actuals. These are my predictions, and you can kind of see the the shape here is that as we predict higher numbers, they actually are higher numbers, and you can also see the histogram of the predictions and a histogram of the actuals. So I was just kind of plotting that just to show you another interesting visualization. Uh, could you please uh, explain the n factors? Uh, why it's set to fifty? It's set to fifty because I tried a few things and it seemed to work. That's all. What does it mean by this? It's the it's the dimensionality of the embedding matrix. Okay. Um, or to think of it in another way, it's like how, you know, rather than being five, it's 50. Jeremy, um, I have a question about, uh, suppose that your um, um, recommendation system is more implicit, so you have zeros or ones instead of just um, actual numbers. Right, so basically we would then um, need to use a classifier instead of a regressor. Um, I, you have to sample the negative or something like that. So if you don't have, if you just have once, let's say, like just kind of implicit feedback. Oh, I'm not sure we'll get to that one in this class. But I, what I will say is, like in the case that you're just doing classification rather than regression, um, we haven't actually built that in the library yet. Maybe somebody this week wants to try adding it. It would only be a small number of lines of code. You basically have to change the um, activation function to be a sigmoid. And you would have to change the um, the criterion or the loss function to be uh, cross entropy uh, rather than um, RMSE, uh, and that will give you uh, a classifier rather than a regressor. Uh, those are the only things you'd have to change. So hopefully somebody this week will take up that challenge, and by the time we come back next week, we will have that working. Okay. So um, I said that we're basically doing a, a, a dot product. Right or a, you know, a dot product is kind of the vector version, I guess, of, of the of this matrix product. Um, so we're basically doing each of these things times each of these things and then add it together. <coughs> so that's a dot product. So let's just have a look at how we do that in PyTorch. So we can create a tensor in PyTorch just using this little capital T thing. Um, you can just say uh, that's the fast AI version. The full version is torch dot from NumPy or something. Um, but I've got it set up so you can basically pass in even a list of lists. So this is going to create a torch tensor with one, two, three, four, and then here's a torch tensor with two, two, ten, ten. Okay. Uh, so here are two torch tensors. I didn't say dot coder, so they're not on the GPU; they're sitting on the CPU. Just FYI. 
Uh, we can multiply them together right? And so anytime you have a mathematical operator between tensors in NumPy or PyTorch um, It will do element wise Assuming that they're the same dimensionality which they are they're both two by two Okay, and so here we've got uh, two by two is four Three by ten is thirty and so forth. Okay, so there's our a times B so if you think about basically what we want to do here is we want to take um, um, Okay, so I've got one Times two is two two times two is four two plus four is six and so that is actually the dot product between one two and two four and then here we've got three by ten is 30 4 by 40 sorry 4 by 10 is 40 30 and 40 is 70 so in other words a times B dot sum along the first dimension so that's summing up the columns in other words across a row okay this thing here is doing the dot product of each of these rows with each of these rows Does that make sense and obviously we could do that with um, You know some kind of matrix multiplication approach, but I'm trying to really do things with as little special case stuff as possible um, Okay, so that's what we're going to use for our dot products from now on so basically all we need to do now is remember we have um, The data we have is not in that cross tab format. So in Excel we've got it in this cross tab format, but we've got it here in this listed format User movie rating, user movie rating, user movie rating. So conceptually, we want to be like looking up this user into our embedding matrix to find their 50 factors, looking up that movie to find their 50 factors, and then take the dot product of those two 50 long vectors. So let's do that. Um, to do it, we're going to build um, a layer, our own custom. Neural net layer. That's not really a neural net, right? So the 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 more generic vocabulary we call this is we're going to build a PyTorch module. Right? So a PyTorch module is a very specific thing. It's something that you can use as a layer in a neural net. Once you've created your own PyTorch module, you can throw it into a neural net. Um, and a module works by assuming we've already got one, say called model. You can pass in some things in parentheses and it will calculate it right uh, so assuming that we already have a module called dot product uh, We can instantiate it like so To create our dot product object and we can basically now treat that like a function right? But the thing is it's not just a function um, Because we'll be able to do things like take derivatives of it um, stack them up together into a big um, Stack of neural network layers blah 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 right so it's basically a function that we can kind of compose very conveniently So here how do we define a module which as you can see here returns a dot product? Well, we have to create a Python class right? And so if you haven't done Python OO before um, you're going to have to learn um, because all PyTorch modules are written in Python OO and it's one of the things I really like about PyTorch Is that it doesn't reinvent totally new ways of doing things like TensorFlow does all the time uh, in PyTorch They you know really tend to use Pythonic ways to do things so in this case How do you create you know some kind of new behavior you create a, a Python class? So Jeremy suppose that you have a lot of data Not just a little bit of data you can have in memory. Uh, will you be able to use fast AI to solve Colorative filtering? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it's, uh, it uses um, uh, mini batch stochastic gradient descent, which does it a batch at a time. Um, the uh, this particular version is going to create a um, pandas data frame, and a pandas data frame has to live in memory. Um, Having said that you can get easily five twelve gig You know instances on Amazon. So like if you had a CSV that was bigger than five twelve gig <laughs> You know that would be impressive uh, if that did happen I guess you would have to instead uh, save that as a big holes array 
and create a slightly different version that reads from a Bcalls array to streaming in, or maybe from a, a Dask data frame, which also, so um, uh, it would be easy to do. I don't think I've seen real-world situations where you have 512 gigabyte collaborative filtering matrices, but yeah, uh, we can do it. Okay, now um, this is PyTorch specific, this next bit is that when you define like the actual work to be done, which is here, return user times movie dot sum, uh, you have to put it in a special method called forward. Okay, and this is this idea that like it's very likely you're creating a neural net, right? In, in a neural net, the thing where you calculate the next uh, set of activations is called the, the forward pass, and so that's doing a forward calculation. The gradients is called the backward calculation. We don't have to do that because PyTorch calculates that automatically. So we just have to define forward. Right? So we create a new class, we define forward, and here we write in our definition of dot product. Okay, so that's it. So now that we've uh, uh, created this uh, class definition, we can instantiate our model, right? And we can call our model and get back the numbers we expected. Okay, so that's it. That's how we create a custom uh, PyTorch layer. Um, and if you compare that to like any other library around, pretty much this is way easier. Um, basically, I guess because we're leveraging what's already in Python. So let's go ahead and now create a more complex um, module, uh, and we're going to basically do the same thing. Uh, we're going to have a forward again. Uh, we're going to have our users times movies dot sum, um, but we're going to do one more thing beforehand, which is we're going to create two embedding matrices, and then we're going to look up our users and our movies in those embedding matrices. So let's go through and and do that. So the first thing to realize is that uh, the users, the user IDs, and the movie IDs may not be contiguous. You know, like they maybe they start at a million and go to a million one thousand, say, right? So if we just used those IDs directly to look up into an embedding matrix, we would have to create an embedding matrix of size one million one thousand, right? Which we don't want to do. So the first thing I do. Is to get a list of the um, unique user IDs, and then I create a mapping from every user ID to a contiguous integer. This thing I've done here, where I've created a dictionary which maps from every unique thing to a unique index, is well worth studying during the week because, like, it's it's super super handy. It's something you very very often have to do in all kinds of machine learning. Right, and so I won't go through it here. It's easy enough to figure out. If you can't figure it out, just ask on the forum. Um, anyway, so once we've got the mapping from user to a contiguous index, uh, we then um, can say, let's now replace the user ID column with that contiguous index. Right. So pandas dot apply applies an arbitrary function. Uh, in Python, lambda is how you create an anonymous function on the fly. And this anonymous function simply returns the index. Do the same thing for movies, and so after that, we now have the same ratings table we had before, but our um, IDs have been mapped to contiguous integers, and therefore they're things that we can look up into an embedding matrix. Um, so let's get the count of our users and our movies, and let's now go ahead and try and create our Python version of this. So earlier on, when we created our simplest possible um, PyTorch module, there was no like state. We didn't need a constructor because we weren't like saying how many users are there or how many movies are there or how many factors do we want or whatever, right? Anytime we want to do something like this, where we're passing in and saying we want to construct our Um, module with this number of users and this number of movies, then we need a constructor for our class. And you create a constructor in Python by defining a dunder in it underscore underscore in it underscore underscore uh, special name. So this just creates a 
constructor. Again, if you haven't done OO before, um, you'll need to do some study during the week, um, but it's uh, a pretty simple idea. This is just the thing that when we create this object, this is what gets run. Okay. Uh, again, special Python thing, when you uh, create your own constructor, you have to call the parent class constructor, and if you want to have all of the cool behavior of a PyTorch module, you get that by inheriting from nn.module, neural net module. Okay, so basically by inheriting here and calling the superclass constructor, we now have a fully functioning PyTorch layer. Okay, so now we have to give it some behavior, and so we give it some behavior by storing some things in it. Right? So here we're going to create something called um, self.u, users, and that is going to be an embedding layer. Uh, number of rows is n users, number of columns is n factors. Right? So that is exactly this, right? The number of rows is n users, number of columns is n factors. And then we'll have to do the same thing for movies. Right? So um, that's going to go ahead and create these two um, randomly initialized arrays. Um, however, uh, when you randomly initialize an array, it's important to randomly initialize it to a reasonable set of numbers, like a reasonable scale. Right? If we randomly initialize them from like naught to a million, then we would start out, and you know, these things would start out being like, you know, billions and billions of size rating. And that's going to be very hard to do gradient descent on. So I just kind of manually figured here, like, okay, about what size numbers are going to give me about the right ratings. And so we know we know we need ratings between about naught and five. Um, so if we start out with stuff between about naught and 0.05, then we're going to get ratings of about the right level. Um, you can easily enough like back calculate that in in neural nets. There are standard algorithms for basically doing doing that calculation, and the basic uh, the key algorithm is um, uh, something called uh, her initialization from timing her, uh, and the basic uh, idea um, is that you take the um, ah, here we are. Uh, you basically set the weights uh, equal to a normal distribution. Um, Uh, with a standard deviation, which is basically inversely proportional to the number of things in the previous layer. Uh, and so in our previous layer, um, uh, so in this case we basically, uh, set, uh, if you basically take that 0 to 0 0.05 and multiply it by the fact that you've got um, 40 things, uh, was it 40 or 50 things coming out of it? 50, 50 things coming out of it, um, then you're going to get something of about the right size. Um, PyTorch has already has like her initialization class there. Like we don't in normally in real life have to think about this. We can just call the existing initialization functions. But we're trying to do this all like from scratch here, okay, um, without any special stuff going on. Um, so there's quite a bit of uh, PyTorch notation here. So self.u we've already set to uh, an instance of the embedding class. Um, it has a dot weight attribute which contains the actual the actual embedding matrix. Um, so that contains this. The actual embedding matrix is um, not a tensor; it's a variable. A variable is uh, exactly the same as a tensor, in other words, it supports the exact same operations as a tensor, um, but it also uh, does automatic differentiation. And that's all a variable is, basically. Um, to pull the tensor out of a variable, you get its data attribute. Okay, so this is so this is now the tensor of the weight matrix of the self.u embedding. And then something that's really handy to know is that all of the tensor functions in PyTorch, you can stick an underscore at the end, and that means do it in place, right? So this is say, create a random uniform random number of an appropriate size for this tensor, and don't return it, but actually fill in that matrix in place. 
Okay, so that's a super handy thing to know about. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be rocket science otherwise. We would have to have gone. Okay, there's the non-in place version. That's what saves us some typing, saves us some screen noise. That's all. Okay, um, so now we've got our randomly initialized uh, embedding weight matrices, uh, and so now the forward, um, I'm actually going to use the same columnar model data that we used for Rossman, um, and so it's actually going to be passed both categorical variables and continuous variables, um, and in this case there are no continuous variables, so I'm just going to grab the zeroth column out of the categorical variables and call it users, and the first column and call it movies. Okay, so I'm just kind of too lazy to create my own. I'm not so much too lazy. I, we do have a special class for this, but I'm trying to avoid creating a special class, so we're just going to leverage this columnar model data class. Okay, uh, so we can basically grab our user and movies um, mini batches, right? And remember, this is not a single user in a single movie. This is going to be uh, a whole mini batch of them. Um, we can now look up that mini batch of users in our embedding matrix U and the movies in our embedding matrix M. Right? So this is like exactly the same as just doing an array lookup to grab the, the user ID numbered value, but we're doing it a whole mini batch at a time. Right? And so it's because PyTorch can do a whole mini batch at a time with pretty much everything that we can get really easy speed up. We don't have to write any loops on the whole to do everything through our mini batch. And in fact, if you do ever loop through your mini batch manually, you don't get GPU acceleration. That's really important to know, right? So you never want to loop, have a for loop going through your mini batch. You always want to do things in this kind of like whole mini batch at a time. Uh, but pretty much everything in PyTorch does things a whole mini batch at a time, so you shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, and then here's our dot product, just like before. All right? So having defined that, uh, I'm now going to go ahead and say, all right, my x values is uh, everything except the rating and the timestamp uh, in my ratings table, my y is my rating, and then I can just say, okay, let's uh, grab a model data from a data frame um, using that x and that y, and here is our list of uh, categorical variables. Okay. Um, and then so let's now instantiate that PyTorch object, right? So we've now created that from scratch. Um, and then the next thing we need to do is to create an optimizer. So this is part of PyTorch. Um, the only fast AI thing here is this line, right? Because it's like I, I don't think showing you how to build data sets and data loaders is interesting enough, really. We might do that in part two of the course. Um, I mean, it's actually so straightforward, like a lot of you are already doing it on the forums. Um, so I'm not going to show you that in this part, uh, but if you're interested, feel free to, to, to talk on the forums about it. Um, but I'm just going to basically take the, the thing that feeds us data as a given, particularly because these things are so flexible, right? You, you know, if you've got stuff in a data frame, you can just use this. You don't have to rewrite it. Um, so that's the only fast AI thing we're using. Um, so this is a PyTorch thing. And so uh, Optim is the thing in PyTorch that gives us an optimizer. We'll be learning about that uh, very shortly. Um, so it's actually the thing that's going to update our weights. Um, PyTorch um, calls them the parameters of the model. So earlier on we said model equals embedding dot blah blah blah, right? And because embedding dot derives from nn.module, we get all of the PyTorch module behavior, and one of the things we got for free is the ability to say dot parameters. Um, so that's pretty that's pretty handy, right? That's the thing that basically is going to automatically give us a list of all of the weights in our model that have to be updated. And so that's what gets passed to the optimizer. Uh, we also pass to the optimizer the learning rate. Um, the weight decay, which we'll talk about later, and momentum, that we'll talk about later. Um, okay, one other thing that I'm not going to do right now, but we will do later, is to write a training loop. So the training loop 
is a thing that loops through each mini batch and updates the weight to subtract the gradient times the loading rate. Um, there's a function in FastAI which is the training loop, um, and it's uh, it's pretty simple. Here it is, right? For epoch in epochs, um, this is just the thing that shows a progress bar. So ignore this. For x comma y in my training data loader, uh, calculate the loss, um, print out the loss in our uh, in our progress bar, um, call any callbacks you have, and at the end, um, call the call the um, metrics on the validation. Right. So there's there's it's just for each epoch, go through each mini batch, um, and do one step of our optimizer. Step is um, uh, basically going to take advantage of this uh, optimizer, but we'll be writing that from scratch shortly. So this is notice we're not using a learner. Okay, we're just using a PyTorch module. So this this fit thing, although it's past it, part of fast AI, it's like lower down the layers of abstraction now. This is the thing that takes a regular PyTorch model. So if if you ever want to like skip as much fast AI stuff as possible, like you've got some PyTorch model, you've got some code on the internet, you basically want to run it, but you don't want to write your own training loop, um, then this is this is what you want to do. You want to call fast AI's fit function. And so what you'll find is like the library is designed so that you can kind of dig in at any layer of abstraction you like, right? And so at this layer of abstraction, you're not going to get things like um, stochastic gradient descent with restarts. You're not going to get like differential learning rates, like all that stuff that's in the learner. Like you could do it, but you'd have to write it all by by hand yourself, right? And so that's the downside of kind of going down to this level of abstraction. Um, the upside is that, as you saw, the code for this is very simple. It's just a simple training loop. It takes a standard PyTorch model. Um, so this is like this is a good thing for us to use here. Uh, we can we can just call it, and it looks exactly like what we're we're used to seeing. Right? We get our um, validation and training loss for the three epochs. Okay. Now you'll notice that we wanted something around 0.76. Um, so we're not there. So in other words, the, 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 the default fast AI collaborative filtering algorithm is doing something smarter than this. Um, so we're going to try and do that. Um, one thing that we can do since we're calling our you know this lower level fit function, there's no learning rate annealing. We could do our own learning rate annealing. So you can hear, see here there's a fast AI function called set learning rates. You can pass in a standard PyTorch optimizer. And pass in your new learning rate, and then call fit again. And so this is how we can like manually do uh, a learning rate schedule. And so you can see we've got a little bit better, 1.13. We've still got a long way to go. Okay. So I think what we might do is we might have a um, seven-minute break, and then we're going to come back and uh, try and uh, improve this score a bit. For those who are interested, somebody was asking me at the break for a kind of a quick walkthrough. So this is totally optional. But um, if you go into the FastAI library, there's a model.py file, um, and uh, that's where fit is, which we're just looking at, um, which goes through uh, each epoch in epochs, and then goes through each x and y in the mini batch, and then it calls this uh, step. Function. Uh, so the step function um, is uh, here, and you can see the key thing is it calculates the output from the model. The model is called M, right? And so if you remember um, our dot product, we didn't actually call model dot forward. We just called model parentheses, and that's because the um, nn dot module automatically. You know, when you call it as if it's a function, it passes it along to forward. Okay, so that's that's what that's doing there, right? And then the rest of this we'll we'll learn about shortly, which is basically doing the 
um, the loss function and then the, the backward pass. Okay, so for those who are interested, that's that's kind of gives you a bit of a sense of how the code is structured if you want to look at it. Um, and as I say, like the the fast AI code is designed to both be world-class performance, but also pretty easy to read. So like, feel free, like take a look at it, and if you want to know what's going on, just ask on the forums. Um, and if you you know if you think there's anything that could be clearer, um, let us know. Because uh, yeah, the code is definitely you know we're going to be digging into the code more and more. Okay, so let's try and improve this a little bit, and let's start off by improving it in Excel. Um, so you might have noticed here that we've kind of got the idea that user 72, you know, like sci-fi, modern movies with special effects, you know, whatever, and movie number 27 is sci-fi and has special effects and not much dialogue. Um, but we're missing an important piece, which is like, user 72 is pretty enthusiastic on the whole, and on average rates things highly, highly, you know, and movie 27, you know, it's just a popular movie, you know, which just on average it's higher. So what we'd really like is to add a constant for the user and a constant for the movie. And remember in, in neural network terms, we call that a bias, right? So we want to add a bias. So we could easily do that, and if we go into the bias tab, here we've got the same data as before, and we've got the same um, latent factors as before, and I've just got one extra row here, and one extra column here, and you won't be surprised here that we now take the same matrix multiplication as before, and we add in that, and we add in that. Okay, so that's our bias. So other than that, we've got exactly the same loss function over here, and so just like before, we can now go ahead and solve that, and now our changing variables include the bias, and we can say solve, and if we leave that for a little while, it will come to a um, better result than we had before. Okay. So that's the first thing we're going to do to improve our model, and there's really very little to show. Um, just to make the code uh, a bit shorter, I have to find a function called getEmbedding, which takes a number of inputs and a number of factors. So the number of rows in the embedding matrix and the number of the embedding matrix. Creates the embedding, and then randomly initializes it. I, I don't know why I'm doing negative to positive here, and I did zero last time. Honestly, it doesn't matter much as long as it's in the right ballpark. Um, and then we return that initialized embedding. Um, so now we need not just our users by factors, which I'll chuck into U, our movies by factors, which I'll chuck into M, but we also need users by one, which we'll put into UB, user bias, and movies by one, which we'll put into movie bias. Okay, so this is just doing a list comprehension going through each of the tuples, creating and embedding for each of them, and putting them into these things. Okay. So now our forward is exactly the same as before, uh, u times m dot sum, uh, I mean this is actually a little confusing because we're doing it in two, two steps, um, maybe to make it a bit easier let's pull this out, put it up here, put this in parentheses, Okay, so maybe that looks a little bit more familiar. All right, u times n dot sum, that's the same dot product, and then here we're just going to add in our user bias and our movie bias. Um, dot squeeze is the PyTorch thing that adds an additional unit axis on. That's not going to make any sense if you haven't done broadcasting before. I'm not going to do broadcasting in this course because we've already done it and we're doing it in the machine learning course. But basically, in, in short, broadcasting is what happens when you do something like this, where um is a matrix, ub, self.ub users, is a, um, is a vector. How do you add a vector to a matrix? 
and basically what it does is it duplicates the vector so that it makes it the same size as the matrix. And the particular way whether it duplicates it across columns or down rows or how it does it is called broadcasting. The broadcasting rules are the same as NumPy. PyTorch didn't actually used to support broadcasting, so I was actually the guy who first added broadcasting to PyTorch using an ugly hack, and then the PyTorch authors did an awesome job of supporting it um, actually inside the language. Um, so now you can use the same broadcasting operations in PyTorch's NumPy. Um, if you haven't dealt with this before, it's really important to learn it, um, because like it's, it's kind of the most important fundamental way to do computations quickly in NumPy and PyTorch. It's the thing that lets you not have to do loops. Now, could you imagine here if I had to loop through every row of this matrix and add each, you know, this vector to every row? It would be slow, it would be you know, a lot more code. Um, uh, and the idea of broadcasting, it actually goes all the way back to um, APL, which was a language designed in the 50s by an extraordinary guy called Ken Iverson. It, it, APL was originally a designed or written out as a new type of mathematical notation. Uh, he has this great uh, essay called um, Notation as a Tool for Thought. And the idea was that like really good notation could actually make you think of better things. And part of that notation is this idea of broadcasting. Uh, I'm incredibly enthusiastic about it, uh, and we're going to use it um, plenty. Um, so um, either watch the machine learning lesson um, or um, You know, Google NumPy broadcasting um, for information. Uh, anyway, so uh, basically, it works reasonably intuitively. We can add on, um, we can add the uh, vectors to the matrix. Um, all right. Uh, having done that, we're now going to do one more trick, uh, which is, um, I think it was Yannette asked earlier about could we squish the ratings to be between one and five. And the answer is we could, right? And specifically what we could do is we could um, put it through a sigmoid function. Right? So to remind you, a sigmoid function looks like that, right? And this is, that's one. Right? We could put it through a sigmoid function, so we could take like 4.96 And put it through a sigmoid function and like that, you know, that's kind of high so it kind of be over here somewhere, right? Um, and then we could multiply that sigmoid like the result of that by five For example, right? And in this case we want it to be between one and five, right? So maybe we'd like multiply it by four and add one for instance. Um, so that's the basic idea um, And so here is that trick we take The result, so the result is basically the, the thing that comes straight out of the um, dot product plus the addition of the biases, um, and put it through a sigmoid function. Now in PyTorch, um, basically all of the functions you can do to tensors are available inside this thing called capital F. And this is like totally standard in PyTorch. Uh, it's actually called torch.nn.functional, but everybody, including all of the PyTorch docs, import torch.nn.functional as capital F. Right? So capital F.sigmoid means a function called sigmoid that is coming from Torch's functional module. Right? And so that's going to apply a sigmoid function to the result, so I'll squish them all between 0 and 1 using that nice little shape, and then I can multiply that by 5 minus 1 equals 4, right? And then add on 1, and that's going to give me something between 1 and 5. Okay? So, like, there's no need to do this. I could comment it out, and it'll still work, right? But now it has to come up with a set of calculations that are always between 1 and 5, right? Where else, if I leave this in, then it's like makes it really easy. It's basically like, oh, if you think this is a really good movie, just calculate a really high number. It's a really crappy movie, it's kept at a really low number, and I'll make sure it's in the right region. So even though this isn't a neural network, it's still a good example of this kind of like, if you're doing any kind of parameter fitting, try and make it so that the thing that you want your function to return, it's like it's easy for it to return that. Okay? Um, so that's why we do that, that function squishing. 
Um, so we call this embedding.bias uh, So we can create that in the same way as before you'll see here I'm calling dot CUDA to put it on the GPU because we're not using any learner stuff normally that will all happen for you But we have to manually say put it on the GPU uh, This is the same as before create our optimizer fit exactly the same as before and these numbers are looking good all right, and again, we'll do a little um, change to our learning rate learning rate schedule and we're down to 0.8. So we're actually pretty close. Pretty close. Um, so that's the key steps. Um, and this is how this is how most uh, collaborative filtering is done. And um, Yannette reminded me of an important point, which is that this is not strictly speaking a matrix factorization because strictly speaking a matrix factorization would take that matrix by that matrix to create this matrix and remembering um, Anywhere that this is empty like here or here We're putting in a zero right we're saying if the original was empty put in a zero right now normally You can't do that with normal matrix factorization with normal matrix factorization It creates the whole matrix and so it was a real problem actually when people used to try and use traditional linear algebra for this because when you have these sparse matrices like in practice this matrix is not doesn't have many gaps because we picked the users that watch the most movies and the movies that are the most watched But if you look at the whole matrix, it's it's mainly empty and so traditional Techniques treated empty as zero and so like you basically have to predict a zero as if the fact that I haven't watched a movie means I don't like the movie and that gives terrible answers so this um, probabilistic matrix factorization approach um, takes advantage of the fact that our data structure actually looks like this rather than that cross tab right and so it's only calculating the loss for the user ID movie ID combinations that actually appear that's right? so actually like user ID 1 movie ID 1029 should be 3 it's actually three and a half so our loss is 0.5 like there's nothing here that's ever going to calculate a prediction or a loss for a user movie combination that doesn't appear in this table Right? By definition the only stuff that we can appear in a mini batch is what's in this table okay? And like a lot of this happened interestingly enough actually in the Netflix prize um, So before the Netflix prize came along This probabilistic matrix factorization it, it had actually already been invented, but nobody noticed Right? And then in the first year of the Netflix prize someone wrote this like really really famous blog post where they basically said like hey check this out uh, Incredibly simple technique works incredibly well and suddenly all the Netflix leaderboard entries were like much much better uh, And so you know that's quite a few years ago now and this is like now Every collaborative filtering approach does this not every collaborative filtering approach adds this sigmoid thing by the way It's not like Rocket science. This is this is not like the NLP thing. We saw last week, which is like hey This is a new state of the art like this is you know not particularly uncommon But there are still people that, that don't do this and it definitely helps a lot right to have this and so um, Actually, you know what we could do is maybe now's a good time to have a look at the definition of this right so the column data module uh, contains all these definitions um, and we can now compare this to the thing we originally used which was Whatever came out of collab filter data set, right? So let's go to Collab Filter data set here it is and we called get learner Right, so we can go down to get learner and that created a collab filter learner Passing in the model from get model here's get model so it created an embedding dot bias and So here is embedding dot bias and You can see here here. It is like it's the same thing. There's the embedding for each of the things 
here's our forward that does the u times i dot sum plus plus sigmoid. So in fact, we have just actually rebuilt what's in the fast AI library, literally. Okay. Um, it's a little shorter and easier because we're taking advantage of the fact that there's a special um, collaborative filtering data set. Um, so we can actually we're getting passed in the users and the items and we don't have to pull them out of cats and cons um, But other than that this is exactly the same So hopefully you can see like the, the fast AI library is not some inscrutable code containing concepts You can never understand we've actually just built up this entire thing from scratch ourselves and so why did we get uh, 0.76 rather than 0.8 um, You know, I, I think it's simply because we used a stochastic gradient descent with restarts and a cycle multiplier and an atom optimizer. You know, like a few little training tricks. Uh, yes, you know. So I'm, I'm looking at this and um, thinking that is uh, we could to to totally improve this model, but maybe looking at the date and doing hmm. some tricks with the date because yeah. this this is kind of a just a regular kind of model in yeah. a way. Yeah, you can add more features. To yeah, it. exactly exactly so like now that you've seen this you could now You know even if you didn't have Embedding dot bias in a notebook that you've written yourself But it's some other model that's in fast AI you could look at it in fast AI and be like oh That does most of the things that I'd want to do, but it doesn't deal with time and so you could just go Oh, okay, let's grab it copy it, you know pop it into my notebook and Let's create you know the better version Right, and then you can start playing, right? And you can now create your own model class from the open source code here. And so, um, yeah, Yannette's mentioning a couple of things we could do. We could try incorporating timestamps, so we could assume that maybe, um, well, maybe there's just like some uh, uh, for a particular user over time, users tend to get more or less positive about movies. Um, Also remember there was the uh, list of genres for each movie. Maybe we could incorporate that um, So one problem is it's a little bit difficult to incorporate that stuff Into this embedding dot bias model because it's kind of it's pretty custom, right? So what we're going to do next is we're going to try to create a Neural net version of this right? So the basic idea here Is we're going to take exactly the same thing as we had before. Here's our list of users, right? And here is our embeddings, right? And here's our list of movies, and here is our embeddings, right? And so as you can see, I've just kind of transposed um, the movie ones so that so that they're all in the same orientation. And here is our user movie rating, uh, but D cross tab. Okay, so in the original format, so each row is a user movie rating Okay So the first thing I do is I need to replace user 14 with that users um, Contiguous index right and so I can do that in Excel using this um, match that basically says what you know How far down this list do you have to go and it said? Uh, user 14 was the first thing in that list Okay, user 29 was the second thing in that list and so forth. Okay um, So this is the same as that thing that we did um, In our Python code where we we basically created a dictionary to map this stuff So now we can for this particular user movie rating combination we can look up the appropriate embedding Right and so you can see here what it's doing is it's saying all right, let's basically Offset from the start of this list um, And the number of rows we're going to go down is equal to the user index and the number of columns we're going to go across is One two three four or five. Okay, and so you can see what it does is it creates 0.19 point six three point three one here It is point one nine point three. Okay, so so this is literally Modern embedding does but remember this is exactly the same as doing a One hot encoding, right? Because if instead this was a vector containing one zero 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 zero, right, and we multiplied that by 
this matrix, then the only row it's going to return would be the first one. Okay. So, so it's really useful to remember that embedding actually just is a matrix product. The only reason it exists, the only reason it exists, is because this is an optimization. You know, this lets PyTorch know, like, okay, this is just a matrix multiply, but I guarantee you that you know this thing is one hot encoded. And therefore, you don't have to actually do the matrix multiply. You can just do a direct lookup. Okay, so that's literally all an embedding is: is it is a computational performance thing. For a particular kind of matrix multiplier. All right, so that looks up that user's user, and then we can look up that user's movie. All right, so here is movie ID, movie ID 417, which apparently is index number 14. Here it is here. So it should have been 0.75.47. Yes, it is 0.75.47. Okay, so we've now got the user embedding and the movie embedding, and rather than doing a dot product of those two, right? Which is what we do normally. Um, instead, what if we concatenate the two together into a single vector of length ten, and then feed that into a neural net, right? And so, any time we've got, you know, a, a, a tensor of Input activations or in this case a tensor of actually this is a tensor of output activations. This is coming out of an embedding layer um, We can chuck it in a neural net because neural nets we now know can calculate anything Okay, including hopefully collaborative filtering. So let's try that So here is our embedding net so This time I have not bothered to create a separate um, bias because uh, instead the uh, linear layer in PyTorch already has a bias in it right so when we go nn dot linear right let's kind of draw this out so we've got our u matrix right and this is the number of users and this is the number of factors, right? And we've got our M matrix, right? So here's our number of movies, and here's our, again, number of factors, right? And so, remember, we look up a single user, we look up a single movie, and let's grab them and concatenate them together. Right, so here's like the user part. Here's the movie part okay. And then let's put that through a matrix product Right so that number of rows here is going to have to be the number of users plus the number of movies Right because that's how long that is and then the number of columns Can be anything we want Because we're going to take that so in this case we're going to pick 10 apparently, so let's pick 10. And then we're going to stick that through a ReLU and then stick that through another matrix, which obviously needs to be of size 10 here. And then the number of columns is of size 1 because we want to predict a single rating. Okay? And so that's our kind of flow chart. Of what's going on, right? It is a standard um, I would call it a one hidden layer neural net. It depends how you think of it like there's kind of an embedding layer But because this is linear and this is linear the two together is really one linear layer, right? It's just a computational convenience So it's really got one hidden layer because it's just got one layer before this nonlinear activation right? So in order to create a um, uh, a linear layer with some number of rows and some number of columns. You just go nn dot linear. Um, in the machine learning class this week, we learnt how to create a linear layer from scratch by creating our own weight matrix and our own biases. So if you want to check that out, 
um, you can do so there, right? But it's the same basic technique we've already seen. Um, so we create our embeddings, we create our two linear layers. Um, that's all the stuff that we need to start with. Um, you know, really, if I wanted to make this more general, I would have had another parameter here called like um, num hidden, you know, equals equals 10, and then this would be a parameter. And then you could like more easily play around with different numbers of activations. So when we say like, okay, in this layer, I'm going to create a layer with this many activations, all I mean, assuming it's a fully connected layer, is my linear layer has how many columns in its weight matrix. That's how many activations it creates. All right, so we grab our users and movies, we put them through our embedding matrix, and then we concatenate them together. Okay, so torch.cat concatenates them together on the first dimension. So in other words, we concatenate the columns together to create longer rows. Okay, so that's concatenating on dimension one. Uh, dropout we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, we've looked at that briefly. Um, so then, having done that, we'll put it through that linear layer we had. We'll do our ReLU, and you'll notice that ReLU is again inside our capital F, our NN dot functional. Right? It's just a function. So remember, activation functions are basically things that take one activation in and spit one activation out. In this case. Take in something that can have negatives or positives and truncate the negatives to zero. That's all ReLU does. Um, and then here's our sigmoid. So that's that that is now a genuine neural network. I don't know if we get to call it deep. It's only got one hidden layer, but it's definitely a neural network, right? And so we can now construct it. We can put it on the GPU. We can create an optimizer for it, and we can fit it. Right. Now you'll notice there's one other thing I've been passing to fit, which is what loss function are we trying to minimize? Okay, and this is the mean squared error loss. And again, it's inside f. Okay, pretty much all the functions are inside f. Okay, so one of the things that you have to pass fit is something saying like, how do you score this? What counts as good or bad? So Jeremy, now that we have um a real neural net, do we have to use the same number of embeddings for users and... That's a great question. You, you don't. No, it's absolutely right. You don't. And so, like, we've got a lot of benefits here, right? Because if we, you know, think about, um, you know, we're grabbing a user embedding, we're concatenating it with a movie embedding, which maybe is like, I don't know, some different size. Um, but then also perhaps we looked up the genre of the movie and like, you know, there's actually a embedding matrix of like number of genres by, I don't know, three or something. And so like we could then concatenate like a genre embedding and then maybe the timestamp is in here as a continuous number, right? And so then that whole thing we can then feed into, you know, our neural net. Right? And then at the end, remember our final nonlinearity was a sigmoid, right? So we can now recognize that this thing we did where we did sigmoid times max rating minus min rating plus blah 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 um, is actually just another nonlinear activation function, right? And remember in our last layer we used generally different kinds of activation functions. So as we said, we don't need any activation function at all, right? We could just do That right, but by not having any nonlinear activation function, we're just making it harder. So that's why we put the sigmoid in there as well Okay, so uh, we can then fit it in the usual way and There we go, you know interestingly we actually got a better score than we did with our this model. Um, so it'll be interesting to try training this with stochastic gradient descent with restarts and see if it's actually better. Um, you know, maybe you can play around with the number of hidden layers and the dropout and whatever else, and see if you can come up with, you know, uh, get a better answer than 
point seven six ish. Okay, so so general so this is like if you were going deep into collaborative filtering at your workplace or whatever, this wouldn't be a bad way to go. I could like I'd start out with like, oh, okay, here's like a collab filter data set, it's already in fast AI, get learner, there's a, you know, not much I can send it, basically number of factors is about the only thing that I pass in. Uh, I can learn for a while, maybe try a few different approaches, and then you're like, okay, there's like, that's how I go if I use the defaults. Um, Okay, how do I make it better? And then I'd be like digging into the code and saying like, okay, well, what did Jeremy actually do here? Is this actually what I want? You know, and and and, and fiddle around with it. So one of the nice things about the neural net approach is that you know, as Jeanette mentioned, um, we can have different numbers of embeddings. Uh, we can choose how many hidden, and we can also choose dropout, right? So. So what we're actually doing is we haven't just got ReLU, but we're also going like, okay, let's let's delete a few things at random, right? So that's dropout. Right? So in this case, we were deleting after the first linear layer, seventy-five percent of them. Right, and then after the second linear layer, seventy-five percent of them. So we can add a whole lot of regularization here. So you know, this, it kind of feels like the this this embedding net. Um, you know, you could you could change this again. We could like have it so that we could pass into the constructor. Um, well, if we wanted to make it look as much as possible like what we had before, we could pass in p's. P's equals zero point seven five. 0.75. Um, I'm not sure this is the best API, but it's not terrible. Um, probably what, since we've only got exactly two layers, we could say p1 equals 0.75. p2 equals 0.75. And so then this will be p1. This will be P2, you know, uh, where we go. And like if you wanted to go further, um, you could make it look more like our, um, our structured data learner. You could actually have a thing, this number of hidden, you know, maybe you could make a, a list. And so then rather than creating exactly one hidden layer and one output layer, this could be a little loop that creates n hidden layers, each one of the size you want. So like this is all stuff you can play with during the during the week if you want to. Um, and I feel like if you've got like a much smaller collaborative filtering data set, you know, maybe you'd need like more regularization or whatever. If it's a much bigger one, maybe more layers would help. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I haven't seen much discussion of this kind of neural network approach to collaborative filtering, um, but I'm not a collaborative filtering expert, so maybe it's maybe it's around, but that'd be an interesting thing to try. Um, so the next thing I wanted to do was to talk about um, the training loop. So what's actually happening inside the training loop? So at the moment we're basically passing off the actual updating of the weights to PyTorch's optimizer. Um, but what I want to do is like understand what that optimizer is is actually doing. Uh, and we're also I also want to understand what this momentum term is doing. So you'll find we have a spreadsheet called grad desk, gradient descent. Uh, and it's kind of designed to be read left to right, oh, sorry, right to left, uh, worksheet-wise. So the rightmost worksheet is some data, right? And we're going to implement gradient descent in Excel, because obviously everybody wants to do deep learning in Excel, and we've done collaborative filtering in Excel, we've done convolutions in Excel, so now we need SGD in Excel so we can replace Python once and for all. Okay, so um, let's start by creating some data. Right, and so here's um, you know here's some independent you know I've got one uh, column of X's 
you know, and one column of y's. And uh, these are actually directly linearly related. So this is this is random, right? And this one here is equal to x times two plus thirty. Okay. So let's try and use Excel to take that data and try and learn those parameters. Okay. That's going to be our goal. So let's start with the most basic version of SGD. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run a macro so you can see what this looks like. So I'll hit run, and it does five epochs. I do another five epochs. Do another five epochs. Okay. So um, the first one was pretty terrible. It's hard to see, so I'll just delete that first one to get better scaling. All right. So you can see actually it's pretty constantly improving the loss, right? This is the loss per epoch. All right, so how do we do that? So let's reset it. Um, so here is my x's and my y's. And what I do is I start out by assuming some intercept and some slope, right? So this is my randomly initialized weights. So I have randomly initialized them both to one. Uh, you could pick a different random number if you like, uh, but I promise that I randomly picked the number one uh, twice. There you go. Um, it was a random number between one and one. Uh, so here is my intercept and slope. I'm just going to copy them over here, right? So you can literally see this is just equals c1, and here is equals c2. Okay. So I'm going to start with my very first row of data, x equals 14, y equals 58, and my goal is to come up, um, after I look at this piece of data, I want to come up with a slightly better intercept and a slightly better slope. Okay. So to do that, um, I need to first of all basically uh, figure out um, which direction is, is down. In other words, if I make my intercept a little bit higher or a little bit lower, would it make my error a little bit better or a little bit worse? So let's start out by calculating the error. So to calculate the error, the first thing we need is a prediction. So the prediction is equal to the intercept plus x times slope. Right. So that is our zero hidden layer neural network. Okay. Um, and so here is our error. It's equal to our prediction minus our actual squared. So we could like play around with this. I don't want my error to be 1849. I'd like it to be lower. So what if we set the intercept to 1.1? 1849 goes to 1840. Okay. So a higher intercept would be better. All right. What about the slope? If I increase that, it goes from 1849 to 1730. Okay, a higher slope would be better as well. Uh, not surprising, because we know, actually, that they should be 30 and 2. So one way to um, figure that out uh, you know, in code, in the spreadsheet, is to do literally what I just did. It's to add a little bit to the intercept and the slope and see what happens. And that's called finding the derivative through finite differencing. Right? And so let's go ahead and do that. So here is the value of my error. If I add 0.01 to my intercept, right? So it's c4 plus 0.01, and then I just put that into my linear function, and then I subtract my actual all squared, right? And so that causes my error to go down a bit. Right? So increasing um, my um, Why is that increasing C4 increasing the intercept a little bit has caused my error to go down So what's the derivative? Well, the derivative is equal to how much the dependent variable changed by divided by how much the independent variable changed by Right and so there it is right our dependent variable changed by that minus that Right and our independent variable we changed by 0.01 So there is the estimated value of the error DB Right? So remember when people are talking about derivatives, right, this is this is all they're doing. Right? Is they're saying what's this value? But as we make this number smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? As it as it limits to zero, 
Um, I'm not smart enough to think in terms of like derivatives and integrals and stuff like that So whenever I think about this I always think about you know an actual like plus 0.01 divided by 0.01 because like I just find that easier Just like I never think about probability density functions. I always think about actual probabilities. I like toss a coin Something happens three times, you know, blah blah blah. So I always think like remember it's it's totally fair to do this because a computer Is discrete. It's not continuous like a computer can't do anything infinitely small anyway, right? So it's actually got to be calculating things at some level of precision, right? And our brains kind of need that as well So this is like my version of Jeffrey Hinton's like to visualize things in more than two dimensions You just like say 12 dimensions really quickly while visualizing it in two dimensions This is my equivalent, you know to, to, to think about derivatives. Just think about division Um, and like although all the mathematicians say no you, you can't do that You actually can like if you think of dx dy as being literally, you know change in x over change in y like The division actually like the, the calculations still work like all the time. So um, Okay, so let's do the same thing now with um, changing um, my slope by a little bit and So here's the same thing right and so you can see both of these are negative Okay, so that's saying if I increase my intercept my loss goes down if I increase my slope my loss goes down right and so my derivative of my error with respect to my slope is is actually pretty high and that's not surprising because um, it's actually um, You know the constant term is just being added whereas the slope is being multiplied by 40 Um, okay, now <clears throat> Finite differencing is all very well and good, but there's a big problem with finite differencing in high dimensional spaces and the problem is this right and this is like You don't need to learn how to calculate derivatives or integrals But you need to learn how to think about them spatially right and so remember we have some Vector very high dimensional vector. It's got like a million items in it, right? And it's going through Some weight matrix right of size like 1 million by size 100,000 or whatever and it's spitting out something of size 100,000 and So you need to realize like there isn't like a gradient here, but it's like for every one of these things in this vector right There's a gradient in every direction, you know in every part of the output right, so it actually has Not a single gradient number not even a gradient um, uh, Vector but a gradient matrix right um, and so this This is a lot to calculate right I would literally have to like add a little bit to this and see what happens to all of these Add a little bit to this see what happens to all of these right to fill in one column of this at a time so that's going to be Horrendously slow like that, that so that's why like if you're ever thinking like oh, we can just do this with finite differencing Just remember like okay. We we're dealing in the with these very high dimensional vectors where um, You know this this kind of um, Matrix calculus Like all, all the concepts are identical, but when you actually draw it out like this you suddenly realize like okay for each number I could change There's a whole bunch of numbers that impacts and I have this whole matrix of things to compute right and so Your gradient calculations can take up a lot of memory and they can take up a lot of time So we want to find some way to do this more quickly Okay um, And it's definitely well worth like spending time kind of studying these ideas of like You know uh, the idea of like the gradients like look up things like Jacobian And Hessian They're the things that you want to search for to start writing about this unfortunately people normally write about them with you know lots of Greek letters and Blah blah blahs, right? But there are some, there are some nice, 
you know intuitive explanations out there and hopefully you can share them on the forum if you find them because this is stuff you you really need to really need to understand in here <clears throat> you know because you're trying to train something and it's not working properly and like later on we'll learn how to like look inside PyTorch to like actually get the values of the gradients and you need to know like okay well how would I like plot the gradients you know what would I consider unusual like you know these are the things that turn you into a really awesome deep learning practitioner is when you can like debug your problems by like grabbing the gradients and doing histograms of them and like knowing you know That you could like plot that oh each layer my average gradient's getting worse or you know bigger or you know whatever. Okay, so the trick to doing this more quickly is to do it um, analytically uh, rather than through finite differencing. And so analytically is basically there is a list. Uh, you probably all learned it at high school. There is a literally a list of rules that for every mathematical function there's a like this is the derivative of that function. Right. So um, you probably remember a few of them. Um, for example, um, x squared is 2x. Right. And so we actually have here an x squared, uh, so here is our two times. Right. Now the one that I actually want you to know is not any of the individual rules, but I want you to know the chain rule, right? which is You've got some function of some function of something. Why is this important? I don't know. That's a linear layer. That's a ReLU, right? And then we can kind of keep going backwards, right? Etc. Right? A neural net is just a function of a function of a function of a function, where the innermost is, you know, it's basically linear, ReLU, linear. ReLU dot 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 linear sigmoid or softmax, right? And so it's a function of a function of a function. And so therefore, to calculate the derivative of the weights in your model, um, the loss of your model with respect to the weights of your model, you're going to need to use the chain rule, and specifically. Whatever layer it is that you're up to, like I want to calculate the derivative here, I'm going to need to use all of these, all of these ones, because that's all the, that's, that's the function that's being applied, right? And that's why they call this backpropagation, because the value of the derivative of that is equal to that derivative. Now, basically, you can do it like this. You can say, let's call u is this, right? Let's call that u, right? Then it's simply equal to the derivative of that times derivative of that, right? You just multiply them together, and so that's what backpropagation is. Like, it, it's not that backpropagation is a new thing for you to learn. It's not a new algorithm. It is literally take the derivative of every one of your layers and multiply them all together. So like it doesn't deserve a new name, right? Apply the chain rule to my layers does not deserve a new name, but it gets one because us neural networks folk really need to seem as clever as possible. It's really important that everybody else thinks that we are way outside of their capabilities, right? So the fact that you're here means that we failed because you guys somehow think that you're capable. Right? So remember, it's really important when you talk to other people that you say back propagation and rectified linear unit rather than like multiply the layers gradients or replace negatives with zeros. Okay? So, so here we go. So here is so I've just gone ahead and um, grabbed the uh, derivative. Unfortunately, there is no automatic differentiation in Excel yet. So I did the alternative, which is to paste the formula into Wolfram Alpha. And got back the derivative. So there's the first derivative, and there's the second derivative analytically. Uh, we only have one layer in this uh, infinite, uh, tinily small neural network, so we don't have to worry about the chain rule. Uh, and we should see that this analytical derivative is pretty close to our estimated derivative from the finite differencing, and indeed it is, right? And we should see that these ones are pretty similar as well, and indeed they are, right? And if you're, uh, you know, back when I 
implemented my own neural nets 20 years ago, I you know had to actually calculate the derivatives, and so I always would write like had something that would check the derivatives using finite differencing. And so for those poor people that do have to write these things by hand, you'll still see that they have like a finite differencing checker. So if you ever do have to implement a derivative by hand, please make sure that you um, have a finite differencing checker so that you can test it. All right. So there's our derivatives. Um, so we know that if we increase uh, b, then we're going to get a slightly better loss. So let's increase b by a bit. Uh, how much should we increase it by? Well, we'll increase it by some multiple of this, and the multiple we're going to choose is called a learning rate. And so here's our learning rate. So here's 1e neg 4. Okay? So our new value is equal to whatever it was before, minus our derivative times our learning rate. Okay, so we've gone from 1 to 1.01. And then a, we've done the same thing, so it's gone from 1 to 1.12. So this is a special kind of mini-batch, it's a mini-batch of size 1. Okay, so we call this online gradient descent. Um, it just means mini-batch of size 1. So then we can go on to the next one. x is 86, y is 202, right? This is my intercept and slope copied across from the last row. Okay, uh, so here's my new y prediction, here's my new error, here are my derivatives, here are my new a and b. Right? So we keep doing that for every mini-batch of 1, until eventually we run out uh, at the end of an epoch. Okay? And so then at the end of an epoch, we would grab our intercept and slope and paste them back over here as our new values. There we are. And we can now continue again. All right? So we're now starting with oops, I see that put them in the wrong spot. They should be paste special transpose values. All right. Okay. So there's our new intercept. There's our new slope. Possibly I got those the wrong way around, but anyway, you get the idea. And then we continue. Okay. So I recorded um, the world's tiniest macro, um, which literally just um, uh, copies the final slope and puts it into the new slope. Copies the final um, uh, intercept, puts it into the new intercept, um, and does that five times. And after each time. It grabs the root mean squared error and pastes it into the next spare area, and that is attached to this run button, and so it's going to go ahead and do that five times. Okay? So that's stochastic gradient descent in Excel. So um, it, to turn this into a CNN, right, you would just replace this error function, right, and therefore this prediction with the output of that convolutional example. Spreadsheet, okay, and that then would be an, a CNN being trained with with SGD, okay. Um, now the problem is that you'll see when I run this, it's kind of going very slowly, right? We know that we need to get to a slope of two and an intercept of thirty, and you can kind of see at this rate, it's going to take a very long time. Right? And specifically, it's like it keeps going the same direction. So it's like, come on, take a hint, that's a good direction. So the come on, take a hint, that's a good direction, please keep doing that, but more, is called momentum. Right? So on our next spreadsheet, we're going to implement momentum. Okay. So what momentum does is the same thing, and what, to simplify this spreadsheet, I've removed the finite differencing columns. Okay. Other than that, this is just the same, right? So we still got our x's, our y's, our a's and b's, our predictions. Um, our error is now over here. Okay. Um, and here's our derivatives. Okay. Um, our new 
calculation for, let's grab a particular row, um, our new calculation here for our new um, a term, uh, just like before, is it's equal to whatever a was before, um, minus, okay, now this time I'm not taking the derivative, but I'm minusing some other number times the loading rate. So what's this other number? Okay, so this other number is equal to the derivative times, what's this, k1.02 plus 0.98 times the thing just above it. Okay, so this is a linear interpolation between this row's derivative, or this mini batch's derivative, and whatever direction we went last time. Right? So in other words, keep going the same direction as you were before, right? but update it a little bit. Right? And so in our, um, uh, in our Python just before, we had a momentum of 0.9. Okay. So you can see what tends to happen is that our negative kind of gets more and more negative, right? all the way up to like 2000. Where else with our standard SGD approach, our derivatives are kind of all over the place, right? Sometimes there's 700, sometimes negative 700, positive 100, you know. So this is basically saying like, yeah, if, if you've been going down for quite a while, keep doing that until finally here it's like, okay, that's that seems to be far enough. So that's getting less and less and less negative, right? And still we start going positive again. So you can kind of see why it's called momentum. It's like once you start traveling in a particular direction for a particular weight, you kind of the wheels start spinning, and then once the gradient turns around the other way, it's like, oh, slow down, we've got this kind of momentum, and then finally turn back around. Right? So when we do it this way, right, we can do exactly the same thing, right? And after five iterations, we're at 89. Whereas before, after five iterations, we're at 104, right? And after a few more, let's do maybe 15. Okay, so that gets us to 102. We're else here. Keeps going, right? So it's 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 a bit better. It's not heaps better. You can still see like. These numbers, they're not zipping along, right? But it's definitely an improvement. And it also gives us something else to tune, which is nice. Like, so if this is kind of a well-behaved error surface, right? In other words, like, although it might be bumpy along the way, there's kind of some overall direction. Like, imagine you're going down a hill, right? And there's like bumps on it, right? So the more, more momentum you get up, you're kind of skipping over the tops, right? So we could say like, okay, let's increase our beta up to 0.98. Right, and see if that like allows us to train a little faster. And whoa, look at that! It suddenly went straight to 82. Right. So one nice thing about things like momentum is it's like another parameter that you can tune to try and make your model train better. In practice, um, basically everybody does this. Every like you, you look at any like ImageNet winner or whatever, they all use momentum. Okay. Um, and so, back over here, when we said use SGD, that basically means use the, the basic tab of our Excel spreadsheet, but then momentum equals 0.9 means add in, put a 0.9 over here. Okay? Um, and so that, that's kind of your like default starting point. So let's keep going and talk about Atom. So Atom is something which um, I, I, I actually was not right earlier on in this um, course. I said we've been using Atom by default. We actually haven't. We've actually been. I, I noticed uh, we've actually been using SGD with momentum by default. And the reason is that um, Atom. 
um, has had uh, it's much faster as you'll see it's much much faster to learn with but there's been some problems which is people haven't been getting quite as good like final answers with Adam as they have with SGD with momentum and that's why you'll see like all the you know image net winning solutions and so forth and all the academic papers always use SGD with momentum and Adam seems to be a particular problem in NLP people really haven't got Adam working at all well um, The good news is uh, this was uh, I built it looks like this was solved two weeks ago um, It basically it turned out that the way people were dealing with a combination of weight decay and Adam had a nasty kind of bug in it basically uh, and that's that's kind of carried through to every single library and uh, one of our students um, Anand Sahar has actually just uh, completed a prototype of adding this this new version of Adam is called Adam W into fast AI and he's confirmed that he's getting the, the much faster uh, both the faster um, performance uh, and also the the better accuracy so hopefully we'll have this um, Adam W in fast AI ideally before next week we'll see how we go but very very soon so um, so it is worth telling you about um, about Adam um, so let's talk about it it's, it's actually incredibly simple um, uh, but again you know make sure you make it sound really complicated when you tell people so that you can look clever um, so here's the same spreadsheet again right and here's our randomly selected uh, a and B again somehow it's still one here's our prediction here's our derivatives okay so now how are we calculating our new a and our new B um, you can immediately see it's looking pretty hopeful because even by like row 10 we're like we're seeing the numbers move a lot more right so this is looking um, pretty encouraging so how are we calculating this um, it's equal to our previous value of B minus J H okay so we're gonna have to find out what that is times our learning rate divided by the square root of L8 okay so we're gonna have to dig it and see what's going on one thing to notice here is that my learning rate is way higher than it used to be um, but then we're dividing it by this big number okay so let's start out by looking and seeing what this J8 thing is uh, okay J8 is identical to what we had before J8 is equal to the linear interpolation of the derivative and the previous direction okay so that was easy uh, so one part of Adam is to use momentum in the way we just defined okay the second piece was to divide by square root L8 what is that square root L8 okay is another linear interpolation of something and something else and specifically it's a linear interpolation of f8 squared okay it's a linear interpolation of the derivative squared uh, along with the derivative squared last time okay so in other words we've got two pieces of momentum going on here one is calculating the momentum version of the gradient the other is calculating the momentum version of the gradient squared and we often refer to this idea as a um, exponentially weighted moving average in other words it's basically equal to the average of this one and the last one and the last one and the last one but we're like multiplicatively decreasing the previous ones right because we're multiplying it by 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9 and so you actually see that for instance in the fast AI code if you look at fit we don't just calculate the average loss right um, because what I actually want we certainly don't just report the loss for every mini batch because that just bounces around so much so instead I say average loss is equal to whatever the average loss was last time times 0.98 plus the loss this time times 0.02 right so in other words 
the fast AI library, the thing that it's actually when you do like the learning rate finder or plot loss, it's actually showing you the exponentially weighted moving average of the loss. Okay, so it's like a really handy concept. It appears quite a lot, right? The other handy concept to know about is this idea of like you've got two numbers. One of them is multiplied by some value, the other is multiplied by one minus that value. So this is a linear interpolation of two values. You'll see it all the time. And for some reason, um, deep learning people nearly always use the value alpha when they do this. So like keep an eye out if you're reading a paper or something and you see like alpha times blah 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 plus one minus alpha times some other blah 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 blah, right? Immediately like when people read papers none of us like read every thing in the equation We look at it. and We go. Oh linear interpolation, right? And like so something I was just talking to Rachel about yesterday is like whether we could start trying to find like a, a New way of writing papers where we literally refactor them right like it'd be so much better to have written like linear interpolate blah 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 comma blah 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 right because then you don't have to Have that pattern recognition, right? But until we convince the world to change how they write papers, this is what you have to do: is you have to look, you know, know what to look for, right? And once you do, suddenly the huge page width formulas aren't aren't bad at all. Like you often notice, like for example, the two things in here, like they might be totally identical, but this might be at time t, and this might be at like time t minus one or something, right? Like it's very often these big ugly formulas turn out to be Really really simple if only they had repacked them Okay So what are we doing with this gradient squared? So what we were doing with the gradient squared is We were taking the square root and then we were adjusting the learning rate by dividing the learning rate by that right. Okay, so gradient squared is always positive okay and we're taking the exponentially weighting moving average of a bunch of things that are always positive and then we're taking the square root of that Right, so when is this number going to be high? Um, it's going to be particularly high if there's like one big You know if the, if the gradients got a lot of uh, variation, right? So if there's a high variance of gradient Then this g squared thing is going to be a really high number whereas if it's like a constant amount Right, it's going to be smaller that because when you add things that are squared the squares like jump out much bigger Whereas if there wasn't if there wasn't much change, right, then it's not going to be as big. So basically This number at the bottom here It's going to be high If our gradient is changing a lot now, what do you want to do? If you've got something which is like first negative and then positive and then small and then high right well you probably want to be more careful, right? You probably don't want to take a big step because you can't really trust it, right? So when the when the variance of the gradient is high, we're going to divide our learning rate by a big number, right? Where else, if our learning rate is very similar kind of size all the time, then we probably feel pretty good about the step. So we're dividing it by a small amount, right? and so this is called an adaptive learning rate. And, and like a lot of people have this confusion about Adam. I've seen it on the forum actually where people are like Isn't there some kind of adaptive learning rate where somehow you're like setting different? Uh, learning rates for different layers or something and it's like no not really Right all we're doing is we're just saying like just keep track of the average of the squares of the gradients and use that to Adjust the learning rate. So there's still one learning rate Okay, in this case, it's one Right? But effectively every parameter at every epoch is Being kind of like getting a bigger jump if the learning rate if the gradient's been pretty constant for that weight and a smaller jump Otherwise, okay, and that's Adam. That's the entirety of Adam in in Excel, right? So there's now no reason at all why you can't um, train ImageNet in Excel because you've got you've got access to all of the pieces you need uh, And so let's try this out run Okay, that's not bad right five and we're straight up to 29 and 2 right so the difference between like 
you know, standard SGD in this is 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 huge. And basically, that you know, the key difference was that it figured out that we need to be, you know, moving this number much faster. Okay, and so and so it did. And so you can see we've now got like um, two different parameters. One is kind of the momentum for the gradient piece. The other is the momentum for the gradient squared piece. And they, I, I think they're called like I think there's just a tuple of a, a beta. I think when you when you want to change it in PyTorch, there's a thing called beta, which is just a tuple of two numbers that you can change. Can you pass that, please? Uh, Jeremy, um, so um, so you said the yeah. I, I think I understand this uh, concept of you know when the when a gradient is it goes up and down, then you're not really sure. Mm -hmm. Which direction should should mm -hmm. go? So you should, should kind of slow things down. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you mm -hmm. subtract that yep. gradient from the learning rate. Um, so, but how how do you implement that? How far do you go? I guess maybe I missed something in early on. You do you set a number somewhere? We divide here. Yeah, we divide the learning rate divided by the square root of the moving average gradient squared. So that's where we use it. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Can you be a little more? Sure. So d2 is the learning rate, which is one. Yeah. M27 is our moving average of the squared gradients. So we just go d2 divided by square root m27. That's it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. The new method that you just mentioned, uh, which is in the process of getting implemented in yes, uh, Adam W. Yeah. Adam W. Uh, how different is it uh, from here? Okay, I can. Let's do that. Um, so, um, to understand Adam W, we have to understand weight decay, um, and maybe we'll learn more about that later. Let's see how we go now with weight decay. So the idea is that when you have um, lots and lots of parameters. Like we do with, you know, most of the neural nets we train, um, you very often have like more parameters than data points, or you know, like regularization becomes important. And uh, we've learned how to avoid overfitting by using dropout, right? Which randomly deletes some activations uh, in the hope that it's going to learn some kind of more resilient um, set of weights. There's another kind of regularization we can use called uh, weight decay. Or L2 regularization, and it actually comes kind of it's a kind of classic statistical technique. And the idea is that we take our loss function, right? So we take our like error squared loss function, and we add an additional piece to it. Um, let's add weight decay right now. Uh, the additional piece we add is to basically add the square of the weights. So we'd say plus b squared. Plus a squared. Okay, that is now um, weight decay or L2 regularization. And so the idea is that now um, the the loss function wants to keep the weights small, right? Because increasing the weights makes the loss worse. And so it's only going to increase the weights if the loss improves by more. Than the amount of that penalty, and in fact, to make this weight decay, to proper weight decay, we then need some um, multiplier here, right? So if you remember back in our here, we said uh, weight decay equals WD five uh, e neg four. Okay, so to actually use the same weight decay, I would have to multiply by o point o o o five. Right, so that's actually now the same weight decay. So. Um, if you have a really high weight decay, then it's going to set all the parameters to zero. So it'll never overfit, right? Because it can't set any parameter to anything, right? And so as you gradually decrease the weight decay, a few more weights can actually be used, right? But the ones that don't help much, it's still going to leave it zero or close to zero, right? So that's what that's what weight decay. Is, is is literally to change the loss function to add in this um, uh, sum of squares of weights times some parameter, some some hyperparameter, I should say. 
The problem is that if you put that into the loss function, as I have here, then it ends up in the moving average of gradients and the moving average of squares of gradients for Adam, right? And so basically we end up um, when there's a lot of variation, uh, we end up um, decreasing the amount of weight decay, and if there's very little variation, we end up increasing the amount of weight decay. So we end up basically saying um, penalize parameters, you know, weights that are really high, um, unless their gradient varies a lot, which is never what we intended, right? That's just not not the plan at all. So the trick with um, Adam W is we basically remove weight decay from here, so it's not in the loss function, it's not in the g, not in the g squared, uh, and we move it so that instead it, it's, it's, it's added directly to the, um, when we update with the learning rate, it's added there instead. So in other words, it would be, we would put the weight decay, or actually the gradient of the weight decay in here when we calculate the new a and new b. So it never ends up in our g and g squared. So that was like a super fast description, um, which will probably only make sense if you listen to it three or four times on the video and then talk about it on the forum. Um, yeah, but if you're interested, let me know, uh, and uh, we can also look at Anand's code that's implemented this. Um, and you know, the, the the idea of using weight decay is it's a really helpful regularizer um, because it's basically this way that we can kind of say like, um, you know, please don't increase any of the weight values unless the you know improvement in the loss um, is, is worth it. Uh, and so, generally speaking, um, pretty much all state-of-the-art models have both dropout and weight decay. Um, and I don't claim to know like how to set each one and how much of each to use um, Other than to say like you, you, you it's worth trying both. Can I grab the... Um, to go back to the idea of embeddings, is there hmm. any way to interpret the final sort of user embeddings? Like... Absolutely, we're going to look at that next week. Uh, it's super fun. It turns out that you know, we'll learn what some of the worst movies of all time are. Uh, <laughs> uh, are composite. It's like... Um, It's that John Travolta Scientology one. It's like Battleship Earth or something. I think that was like the worst movie of all time, according to our embeddings. Well, at least we've learned something. <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for scaling the uh, L2 penalty, or is that kind of based on how how wide the nodes or how many nodes uh, there no, are? No, I, I, I have no suggestion at all. Like I, I I kind of look for like papers or Kaggle competitions or whatever. Similar and try to set it vaguely the same. It seems like in a particular area like computer vision object recognition It's like somewhere between 1 in neg 4 or 1 in neg 5 seems to work, you know um, actually in the Adam W paper um, the um, The authors point out that with this new approach it actually becomes like it seems to be much more stable as to what the right weight decay amounts are so hopefully now when we start playing with it we'll be able to have some um, Definitive recommendations by the time we get to part two yeah. All right, well, that's nine o'clock. So um, this week um, You know practice the thing that you're least familiar with so if it's like Jacobians and Hessians read about those if it's broadcasting read about those if it's understanding Python OO read about that You know try and implement your own custom layers read the fast AI layers, you know uh, and and talk on the forum about anything that you find um, weird or confusing. All right, see you next week.